Roger Hallam. You're listening to Designing the Revolution. This is Talk 5, Part 1. So what's the plan? Okay, so yes, we're going to look at the plan. Um, the first thing to say is this is not going to be a whole series of high-pitched rhetoric, excitable, you know, screamy, bring down the government type stuff, in case you haven't noticed. Um, we're going to be looking in a serious, considered, design orientation way at what uh, a revolution will involve. And um, I might add that sort of shouting down the phone from a prison cell about bringing down government's things, probably not a good idea. Uh, it might be a bit tricky. So, um, the other thing to say is, I don't know about you, but you're probably thinking revolutions are pretty, like, difficult, problematic things anyway. And in the perfect world, we wouldn't be having a revolution. We'd be having, uh, you know, a nice sit down and people would be sensible and we could make all the transformations we would like. So it's not like we want this to happen necessarily. It's more like it's going to happen. And if it, in so much as it's going to happen, we've got a responsibility to proactively design it. So that's where we're up to, isn't it? So design is the central word in all of this. Design is not everything, as I've just said, there's different approaches, emotion is enormously important, rhetoric is enormously important, but all we're going to be doing here uh, is thinking systematically how we go about um, bringing all the elements together in a conscious way to maximise the probabilities of a pro-social outcome. That's a bit of a long-winded way of saying it. So it's a little bit like, I think you used this analogy earlier about the Enigma project in World War Two. You know, these brainy guys got together and, um, and worked out the codes of the German communications. And arguably that's what won World War Two. But of course, it wasn't what won World War Two. It was also millions of people giving their lives in a gritty, emotional, full-on, uh, indescribably unpleasant way. So these two things go together. Um, so let's just, you know, summarise where we're up to before we get on to that, talking about the plan. Um, so number one, this revolutionary episode uh, is inevitable. It's coming, whether we like it or not. That's what I spent the last two or three talks talking about. Number two, it could be good or bad. It could be amazing, it could be a total, utter, unbelievable disaster. Uh, it's not going to necessarily be one or the other. Number three, there is enormous amount of agency involved in making it either good or bad. It's a fluid situation. In other words, it's completely open to the influence of proactive design, how we actually make it work. That's what this series of talks is about. And fourth, lastly, we're giving some sort of good enough to go definition. A revolutionary episode, at a minimum, involves the change of the regime. It doesn't involve just to change the government. It doesn't mean getting rid of the state. It means changing the regime that inhabits the state, whether that's an autocracy or a democracy or some 21st century democracy that we're going to be looking at. Um, and potentially and arguably necessarily it will involve a massive amount of social and cultural change, which covers a multitude of things, as you can imagine. Okay, so what are we envisaging here? What I'm envisaging is, is to do something like 40 talks, may well be more. That sounds like horrendously ambitious as I'm telling you this, but that's what I've got down here. And that's what I've been working on. Not that there's enormous amount of other things to do, seeing in the sound there, I think. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's going to be a bit of a journey. I don't know whether I'm actually going to get through them all, um, but that's my plan at the moment. 
side. And needless to say, I'm going to be standing on the shoulders of lots of different giants. I'm not going to be claiming some enormous originality. I think my contribution for what it's worth is to synthesize, to bring together a lot of different traditions, literatures, points of view, experiences, and work them together into a new whole, which arguably is going to be something exciting and new, but we'll see as we go along. That's the project. And needless to say, if you feel you can do better, absolutely brilliant, you know, off you go. You go and do some podcasts. This is a process of collective creation, as you might say. Uh, so if you want to take some of what I've said, cut it up, criticize it, make a video out of it, you know, translate it into some of the languages, feel free, you don't need just permission. It's an open source project. Um, and lastly, I suspect I'm going to do one or two tangential talks as I'm going to talk to them. So I've got a fairly rigid idea that I'm going to be following, you know, a nice rational plan. But every now and again, I'm going to go off on a tangent and look at a particular case study, do something a bit more personal or speculative or even, dare I say, rhetorical, um, just to give a little bit of spice to the whole process and to try and you know, move around our brain cells a little bit, let's put it like that. And, you know, later night I'm thinking, yeah, maybe I'm going to do some interviews with people that know things better than I do, maybe go on a tour, maybe do a bark, you know, whatever. Uh, we'll see how all that progresses. All right. So what I want to do, you know, what's the plan? I want to uh, briefly cover the basic principles and approach that I'm going to take. And in the second part of the talk, I'm going to actually run through what talks I'm going to do so you get an idea of the structure of everything. So, as you probably noticed by now, the starting point of this is this concept of complexity. Um, complexity means things are sort of complicated, but they're not so complicated that you can actually make sort of general predictions and general designs. So the key sort of words here are probing and probability. You probe the complex sort of system that you're looking at. It's not like a car engine, you can't work it out exactly, but it's not chaos, it's not like no one has a clue. It's like you probe it, you get data, and out of that you make probabilistic designs. In other words, you don't know whether they're definitely going to work, but you maximize the probability. So this is difficult for a lot of people to get around, get their head around, because we live in this culture where, you know, something can't be understood or it definitely can be totally understood. No, it's neither of those two things. So a little way of an example, a few years ago, I was very involved in projects where people communities put up their own candidates in elections and there was this guy who done it really successfully and I said to him, well, you know, this is really good. I think we could roll this out. We can work out what are the key, you know, elements in this project, uh, turn them into a sort of training course with some mentoring and people would go off and replicate them around the country. And this uh, person who, I think she was done complexity as part of, she was a lecturer, and she said, no, 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 it's far too complex. You know, you can't replicate it. And I thought, no, that's rubbish. <laughs> you know, you can replicate. You just can't replicate it in the sense of replicating a car engine, right? You can replicate it with a probabilistic approach that it can be replicated all, all, all around the UK. And arguably, uh, that was right. So you can see, like, this is difficult. And I'm going to keep reminding you about this because something I want to get into your head. This is what we're dealing with here. Uh, as opposed to this mechanical, you know, cultural default that we've learned this story that the world's split between black and white. You know, it's either you win me or against me. It's all or nothing. Uh, you know, the set categories, um, blah, blah, this sort of fixed thinking which doesn't involve much cognitive effort. It's quite reassuring the pretense of certainty, all this sort of stuff, right? And of course, a lot of left-wing for is in that sort of tradition. And this is one of the things I'm going to argue is one of the reasons, you know, the left generally has not been successful because of this rigidity. And a lot of this comes 
back to Marx, you know, who made amazing contributions, whether you agree with him or not, you know, in terms of what he was saying, but he was very much part of that 19th century scientific enlightenment, you know, Newtonian tradition where society is a machine, the human being is a machine, we work out how that machine works and we do X, Y and Z and out comes the solution. It's a sort of vulgar, uh, mechanistic orientation and the ghost of that, as it were, pervades a lot of progressive or left thinking today, whether people realise it or not. So I'm trying to make that juxtaposition explicit. We're not doing that. We're doing complexity. So what does this design thing actually concretely involve? You know, how do you operationalise it? Well, this is well established, I think, from people call it design engineering, which is you collect data, right? You get as much information as you can. You come up with a hypothesis, as you might call it, or an idea, a plan, an initial design, a prototype, you know, and you go out and test it. And the idea, of course, is that it's put up holes, it doesn't quite work, or whatever, so you get feedback on it, and then you iterate, and you keep iterating. And each iteration, in other words, you do it again, get more feedback, and you gradually improve it, or maybe, you know, it's totally hopeless, and you drop it and move on to something else, or it works really well, of course. But the key phrases here are optimised, right? You're not involved in getting some ultimate solution. You don't solve the problem. You simply optimise the outputs of the system. So the people I work with, we use this word all the time, you know, optimise. Or more humbly, we say it's, you know, the best suboptimal outcome. In other words, every outcome is going to be suboptimal, right? It's a question of what's the least worst. So that's the approach. Um, and then there's another sort of layer of thinking about this, which is encompassed in this phrase, praxis. So where praxis comes from is this idea that's always theory, okay? So I use this phrase like naive empiricism. So what that means is you just look at the data and you pretend that it's objective. Well, in a sense, it is objective, but your interpretation of it is certainly not objective. In other words, as soon as you look at data, the very process of understanding data involves interpretive bias, as it were. In other words, you have a theory about how the world works. You have a theory about right and wrong. And the, what theory is, or what we need to do, is to make that explicit. This isn't a bad thing, because, as I said, you know, you can't get rid of it anyway unless you have this naive empiricist sort of approach. So what Praxis is saying is accept there is a theory. And in fact, the theory is really important. And bringing a new theory into your practice can enable you to change that practice and look at the empirical information, the data, in a new way. And that opens up all sorts of potential. So what Praxis means is this interaction, this alternation, between a theoretical approach, going out into the real world, practicing it, getting feedback from that, altering the theory or dropping the theory, and then replicating that. So this to and fro, this sort of fusion in a sense between theory and practice, that's what praxis is. One example of praxis is the work of Paolo Ferreri, who wrote a book Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which you may know about. It's always a good book to read. Um, and I don't know if he came up with the phrase, but he certainly used it a lot. So he's, a, he's an example, right? He was, you know, he was a Marxist intellectual guy, but he didn't spend all his time, you know, sitting around writing articles for magazines or stuck in a lecture theatre. He was out with the poor of Brazil, I think it was, doing literacy courses. And through these literacy courses, designing a process through which people uh, co-created their reality, and through that became radicalised and moved towards social and collective action. And that's a classic example of this praxis approach, which is part of a more generic idea which came from 
Gramsci, the uh, Italian guy you probably know about, and his notion of the organic intellectual. So again, the idea is, you know, the intellectual is not someone who sits apart from the social space, from social struggle, from the messiness of real life, but is actually embedded in it in an organic sense and experiences it. So dare I say it, you know, I'm an intellectual, which doesn't mean I'm better than anyone else or anything, just for a record, but I spend an enormous amount of my time thinking about things and designing things, but I'm not sitting there, you know, in front of my computer in my flat, I'm on the front line, here I am, stuck in prison. That's good for me because, you know, it gives me a profoundly emotional and intellectual education, finding out about things I never thought I would, putting my ideas into practice, you know, how does this actually feel, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So you can see how this works, right? It's like super exciting as far as I'm concerned because avoids that false dichotomy between saying, oh, you're theoretical, or you're a practical guy. No, 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 right? We're bringing these things together. Uh, We're going to be smart about it. Okay, so the fourth thing then is this (coughs) obvious approach is to use exaption. So I think I pronounced that right. So this is, you know, this is quite fun, really. Um... What it exaption means, I, uh, I saw a YouTube video by this famous complexity theorist guy. So the original idea was, I think it's part of <coughs> evolutionary theory. So something that, you know, is quite difficult to understand is how you have these big jumps in evolution. For instance, you know, you have animals on the ground. How did they evolve into flying? You know, it's pretty complicated. Anyway, as it turns out, if I've got this right, there was a lot of animals had feathers. Feathers had this function to keep the animals warm, which is all well and good. But at the same time, they basically got longer, and if the animal jumped, it would enable them to fly a little bit. And then through evolution, you've got this like jump of using feathers uh, to enable these animals to fly. And so you've got flight. So you had this exaption of one phenomenon, which had one function into a different system to provide a different function. So it didn't all just start off, you know, incrementally. You had this whole sort of bunch of ideas or or, uh, designs, and they were just transferred whole, as it were, into another system. So... This is what we did with Extinction Rebellion, I would argue, was we exacted sales theory from sort of the capitalistic system into a revolutionary system, a radical system, and combined the two together. So I had revolutionary theory, you know, rebellion against the British government over the climate crisis and all the rest of it. And we brought into that this whole way of actually getting people to do things, <coughs> which was based upon uh, sales theory. Sales theory, obviously, is you know at the heart or part of this whole capitalistic system. So traditionally, people would go, "No, oh, that's capitalism. We don't want anything to do with that." And we're saying, "No, no, no, that's really dumb, right?" You know, in, cap- in, in the capitalist world, there's a whole bunch of different things, contradictory elements things which we could take and exact into our system and make them more vigorous. And arguably that's what gave this extinction rebellion phenomenon its genius, as it were, whereas it brought all these disparate elements together and formed something quite new. And dare I say, this is, you know, what many commentators have said about Marx, like the genius of Marx was that he brought together uh, English political economy, German idealism, French utopian socialism. So these were all separate little themes, as you might say, in the 19th century. (coughs) They either completely ignored each other or hated each other. Well, what Marx did was bring them together and fuse them into something entirely new and systematic, right? So that's what we 
That's what we're about, right? That's what we need to do. And of course, this is what over and over again is not done in progressive, creative, uh, left sort of circles. So another example of this is, you know, I was involved with one or two other people uh, doing a design for the first rent strike in in London for several decades, I think it was. So I did this design, you know, I exacted various ways of canvassing, what have you, from sales theory and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it was successful. Uh, thousands of people went on red strike. There was a successful resolution to it. Myself and the guy that I worked with on it, we wrote a nice book on it. We explained how to do it. And I thought, this is it. You know, it's going to get replicated. I went off to do other research because I was doing my PhD research at King's College at the time. And this, you know, my friend, <laughs> I left him basically the following year to sort of do it again. And all these, you know, left wing people moved into the group and they, you know, were dogmatic far left people. They had an idea about how the world works, they had an idea about how things should be done. And if you weren't doing it like that, then you know, you're an outcast and you got chucked out of the group. And needless to say, nothing happened. Not even a single door was knocked on, dare I say. And, you know, the miserable story is that, as far as I'm aware, several years later, there still hasn't been a rent strike in, in London. So um, I won't comment further on what I think about that. <laughs> okay, so the, um, the, um, the fifth thing then is, and this is a little bit more sort of vague, I suppose, but I'm going to say it, which is, is, is creating on an even bigger level a sort of new way of seeing. So one way of, of, of talking about this is a new paradigm, which is a terrible phrase because it's been used, you know, and what does it mean? But formally speaking, a new paradigm, as I see it, means like a system of theories, like a whole bunch of theories that are brought together into some sort of coherent whole, which may or may not, you know, actually make sense. You know, sometimes it makes sense for 100 or 200 years and then it gradually becomes more and more like dysfunctional and then this new paradigm comes along. So this is precisely really what we're going to be looking at in this, in this run of talks is a new paradigm. So we talk quite a lot about this mechanistic view of the human and what we're, this new paradigm that we're going to introduce is, is going to be moving beyond this mechanical, you know, accountant, calculator, construction of the human, beyond sort of material, atomistic, uh, individualistic view to this notion of the social space, where what we focus our design in is the construction of that space and these organic links the culture, the procedures, the rituals, the norms that exist within people. And it's the design of that which creates this uh, complexity of social connection. So you can see like this is quite different and it spurns a whole bunch of theories out of this new paradigm, as you might say. So an example here is, is as I'm sure you know, like you know, 200 years ago, there was a big revolution in France and there was this big, you know, slogan, liberty, equality, fraternity. And what's sort of got slightly amusing about it is, is liberty and equality, you know, got this massive boost, everyone's heard about them. But the fraternity bit it sort of got lost. And the reason for this, arguably, is because liberty and, and equality are, are quite mathematical concepts. It's like you can nail them down into a mechanistic system. So they fitted into the general paradigm of mechanistic Newtonian view of humanity. And so they become privileged and, and for the next, you know, 100, 200 years they've been the main show. While fraternity is just a little bit embarrassing because it's like, what's that, you know? Um, you know, people getting on with each other. You, you can't really reduce it because by definition, it's not supposed to be reducible, right? It's about the complexity of the human connection, sociability as we're going to call it with a bit more of a modern phrase. So arguably this is one of the reasons why the left has been, you know, massively unsuccessful in terms of getting popular appeal across the generation, across, you know, majority of populations. 
because there's this general sensibility or feeling that it's just cold, it's mechanistic, you know, it's a factory design of humanity, paradoxically, uh, rather than this warm, connected fraternity element. So we're not we're not gonna we're gonna not gonna be doing that, okay? So a last example here is of a paradigm is is this materialistic view of the world. So this is look, there's the world, it's material, uh, it's essentialist, it is what it is, you know, don't argue. And then there's this new paradigm which sort of like deconstructs the notion of the material. So this can be done in two ways. Like first of all people say well, you know, show me something material. They say, well, here's a chair. You know, a chair is a chair is a chair. Well, not exactly, because a chair is relates to a function. Well, a function isn't something essentially material, right? It's a social construct. It's a meaning. You know, why call it a chair? Well, you could just say it's a whole bunch of pieces of wood, right? You know, why why call it a chair? And if you're going to call it a bunch of pieces of wood, well, why call it what you know it could be just a whole bunch of of, 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 of atoms so it, it's not at all obvious what a material thing is in that sense and then the second form of deconstruction as it were is is in the sort of newtonian period there was this idea that atoms were the smallest items in the universe and you know maybe they were but it turned out they weren't so there was in this Newtonian sort of paradigm, there's this essentialism, which is basically everyone's made up of atoms. Okay, so that's great, except it turned out that physics moved on, and that's not true because, as we all know, atoms are made up of, you know, smaller bits and pieces, and they're made up of smaller bits and pieces, and so it goes on, you know, in infinitely, potentially, and all gets quite complicated. So the whole paradigm of some essential material world has been lost and and so we're looking at a new paradigm of constructing things you know in a different way okay so lastly just before i finish this talk i want to say a little bit about my record which you know i say i'm a little bit nervous about it because i don't want to be sound too big-headed on the other hand you know we're dealing with something enormously important here and false modesty has to go out the window as well as far as I'm concerned. So what I'm trying to say here is if you use these processes they can be enormously powerful, these design principles. Not because I'm telling you or because I made them up, right? They're well established, a lot of people use them and they're fantastically powerful and create really strong predictions. Again, not absolute predictions, but the ability to see clearly, as clearly as we can, how social systems work, how you can reorganize them and what's going to happen in the future. So this is something I've been working on for 35 years. I started my activism when I was about 13, 14, 1980s. Um, and what I quickly became interested in is some of it is participatory design, as I called it at the time. So I worked out that, you know, fairly early on, it's how people relate to each other and the systems and rules that people, um, the systems and rules that people uh, are subject to to predict whether things turn out to be a mess and collapse or whether they become sustainable. So in my early 20s, I helped found an organization called Radical Roots, which was existed to set up workers' cooperatives and housing cooperatives. And up to that time, there was a voluntaristic um, culture, particularly in anarchist circles, which is where I was mainly connected with, which was, you know, we can do stuff. If you don't want to do it, you don't want to do it. No one tells us what to do. And then three or four of us said, right, you know, that's all well and good, but it's not going to create anything that's going to actually, you know, impact on society and provide a basis for activists and radicals to begin housing and work and all the rest of it. So we evolved this new design which involved, you know, what we call organised uh, mutual aid, where people came together and they had to be properly trained, they had to send representatives to a gathering once every quarter, and once they 
uh, fulfilled these obligations, as it were, then they became eligible for loans and they could buy their house and settle their community and what have you. And that this created a solidity and uh, sustainability. And I'm very proud to say that this organisation still exists, you know, 25, 30 years later. Now, no one's pretending it's perfect and there's a whole bunch of parts of the design that were a bit tricky and didn't quite work, but it shows like the direction of travel. Um, and, you know, I went off to do organic farming for about 20 years, and when I came back to sort of design of political processes, I talked to, on the basis of my research at King's College, I had a good chat to a Guardian journalist uh, about two years before Extinction Rebellion, and I said to him, right, I predict that there's going to be you know, mass civil disobedience in the Western world within two years. <coughs> and I didn't just pull that out of the hat. I wasn't just trying to be, you know, impressive or whatever. It was a, it came out of a systematic study of of how social change works and the data that existed, and of course the objective horrendousness of the climate crisis. And two years later, you know, we had extinction rebellion. And the Guardian journalist obviously thought I was a bit bonkers at the time. And then afterwards he said, oh, you, you know, you're right. And I'm saying, yeah, well, I'm right because, you know, that's my job. Uh, I'm in the business of making populistic predictions about the future on the basis of a systematic uh, you know, study of the data. So when Extinction Rebellion came along, I said, you know, in, in Christmas 2018, I said, if 10,000 people go to London, they stay there for a whole a week or two, uh, engage in civil disobedience, bringing the centre of London to a standstill, then you, we, we will get uh, a substantial response from the political establishment and create cultural change. And people saying, well, no, you know, civil disobedience, British public aren't going to do that, blah, 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 and all sorts of, you know, objections. But they, you know, they didn't know what they were talking about, dare I say, because they hadn't systematically studied the literature like I had and engaged in five years of research on it. And surprise, surprise, you know, in in uh, in April of that year, uh, Extinction Rebellion exploded into the public sphere and became the biggest global influencer on climate in 2019. Okay, so in 2021, uh, after COVID, I was involved in initiating Insulate Britain. And the idea then, just coming out of COVID, was, you know, the climate movement had been decimated because no one could do anything because of the pandemic and what have you. So then I sat down, literally a piece of paper, and went, OK, so what can 100, 200 people do to create the biggest climate campaign in the UK in 2021. So what I designed and then, you know, elaborated with other people was a demand to insulate Britain involving 100, 200 people sitting on the biggest, most busiest um, motorway in the UK. And again, this design, you know, did what it said on the tin. It became the biggest climate campaign of the year, 80% uh, name recognition had a massive influence on putting insulation up there as the, one of the biggest um, environmental demands from being nowhere and such like. And that led to the credibility, financing, organisational solidity that enabled Just Stop Oil to become the biggest climate campaign in the UK in 2022 this year. Uh, that's just finishing. So this, as you can see, uh, is a sort of pattern, right? There was Extinction Rebellion, there was Insulate Britain, there was just a boil. And then around the Insulate Britain time, what I did was systematise the best practice of the last three to four years of design experience, you know, bringing in the last 50, 100 years of literatures on the subject to bring about social change and we created a standardized version of replicating this in other western democracies and i remember sitting in the meeting with a 
five or six sort of miserable young people <laughs> going, yeah, last generation, you can do it. You know, uh, this was the name and uh, a bunch of people set something up in Australia and then uh, in Germany and in Italy and then, you know, eight or nine Western democracies. And within 12 months, most of those campaigns have become the biggest climate campaigns in decades or of all uh, ever uh, in, in their countries because they followed this design, which was empirically robust. So, you know, I'm sitting here at Christmas 2022 and last generation in Germany is now, you know, a massive operation. It's just raised half a million euros and it's got hundreds of people involved. Uh, took over XR, you know, quite a while ago. 1,500 artists have supported it. You know, it's booming along. It's on the national news. It's demand, you know, quite possibly be accepted. So all of that um, originates in this ongoing iterative design process I've been outlining for you, which is enormously exciting, right? Because, you know, when I'm trying to get people to give money, <laughs> this is what I say is, you know, if I've just been involved in designing Extinction Rebellion, you know, as people rather, um, you know, generally say, oh, it was just a one-off, you know, anyone can do a one-off, and they're totally right, you can just be lucky. But if you then go and design, you know, the biggest climate campaigns in 2021 in, say, Britain, and then just a Poyo, and you have this massive success with the A22 projects, well, you, that's a different kettle of fish. You have to then accept the empirical reality that these guys are basically cracked the code, which doesn't mean you know there's any guarantees, right? As I said, uh, this is always probabilistic, but it's super impressive if the truth be known. And this is why you should be listening to these 30, 40 uh, talks because they're going to give you the detail and the devil's in the detail. So it's on the basis of that record that I've investigated this hypothesis that a revolution, revolutionary episodes are now inevitable, at least in Western democracies in the next uh, 10, 12 years. And, you know, if I was going to be falsely modest, I would say, well, you know, this is something I think probably could happen. But I'm not. I'm being ruthlessly honest with myself and with you by saying, no, it is actually inevitable. It's a done deal for the reasons I've uh, outlined in the previous talk. And it's nothing to do with me or my ego or whatever. It's to do with being ruthlessly empirical. Like, to look at the data, look at the probabilistic elements to it, do the maths, and go, whether I like it or not, this is going to happen. In other words, to put what the reality is in front of what you might like to see. And you might think, yeah, it's pretty easy to do, but it's not. It's actually enormously difficult. In fact, no one does it very well unless you systematically apply your attention over a large period of time to doing it. Uh, and I'll just leave you with this sort of example of how difficult it is. Uh, as I've said, I was at King's College, and as you may know, I was involved in a seminal campaign there that I designed which involved demanding that the college divested from fossil fuels, uh, myself and several other students, uh, through paint over the Gothic Central Hall, causing around £10,000 worth of damage, and then I went on hunger strike for two weeks. All this was pre-designed, uh, pre-organised, I knew what I was doing, and I knew that I was going to win intellectually, I mean emotionally, I was, you know, didn't want to be so presumptuous, but my cold intellect, as it were, I knew that this was going to break through as, as certain as, as, as I could be. Now, lots of other activists were going, you know, it's a terrible idea, it won't work. That's because, you know, dare I say, I didn't really know what they were talking about. Uh, and it was, it was successful um, for the reasons, you know, that I'd, I'd worked out. Now, What's interesting and, you know, super depressing in a way, but completely predictable as well, is lots of people in the environmental movement go, oh, you know, it's fantastic, da, 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 and went to see the director of Greenpeace and, you know, 350 Org and all these people. And they were going, yeah, great idea. And then I was going like, so, you know, time to replicate, guys. <laughs> you know, 
you know, recruit lots of people in all the universities around the Western world, go out, make a demand, go on hunger strike. You know, we're not talking about anything super dramatic here. No, 14 days, no one's going to drop dead. You know, it's a symbolic exercise. And probabilistically speaking, you're, you know, 10,000 times more likely to get success than what you've done over the last 30 years, you know, doing performative, joining committees, all this sort of stuff. What happened? Absolutely nothing. Like, it wasn't replicated. A bit like the, the, the Lorenz strike wasn't replicated at all because people in what you might call the environmentalist herd space are subject, because they're human beings, to this enormous bias which says, if it's not within my cultural experience, I don't believe it's going to work, even though there's empirical support for it. So they thought it was great, but they couldn't conceive of doing it themselves. It sounds completely irrational, but this is how human beings work, is if something's, you know, if you're embedded in a system for 20 odd years, like the director of Greenpeace, you're just not going to be able to bring yourself to do something that makes sense, even though it makes sense, which is, you know, we'll be talking about this quite a lot, which is why it's essential to set up new campaigns, social formations, uh, such as XR or JSR or the A22, because it's only by making this fresh start with this ruthless, vigorous empiricism that you're going to actually be able to design something that's actually functional to the, uh, you know, total and utter crisis that we, um, that we face. So needless to say, there's an enormous amount of responsibility to do it. So that's my case. <laughs> So go and tell your mates and your friends, you know, that are shitting themselves about what's going to be happening in the future and say, this guy's for real, he's done his stuff, he's not God, you know, he's just another guy, but at the end of the day, you know, you've got to go with what looks like it works, so let's listen to what he's got to say and the other people that he works with and, and get in touch with him and, you know, get some training, get some funding and actually get on with the job because... You don't want us to just sit around waiting to die, do you? Um, and on that cheerful note, I think I'll finish. And, yeah, the next part of the talk, I'll talk about more concretely about what the talks are going to involve. Okay, thanks so much.